Hey everyone, I'm uh, Dr. Kevin Canary, one of the new vascular surgeons here. I've met a lot of you, but not all of you. I uh, look forward to working with you guys as we get going here. If I have any audio problems, please you know shoot me a text or something so I can make the adjustment. Um, so I really wanted to focus this talk on like what I think a graduate should leave with being able to offer in the terms of AV dialysis access. This talk is not, let's cover everything about dialysis access if you're a vascular surgeon and you need to uh, treat patients that need dialysis access. This is sort of what the graduating general surgery resident should know um, and able to uh, enhance their practice. So what you'll learn if you stay awake uh, during this next half hour here so how to manage a bleeding fistula. I think this is critical. I think uh, people are gonna get consulted on this, uh, whether they're general or vascular surgery. Um, and I think this is one small thing that we can improve. Um, know the decision-making to create access. Know the principles of managing access complications. Uh, know the magic numbers needed for the ab site. So there's just things that they test and questions they ask specifically related to dialysis access. So we're gonna cover those. And then, uh, I think it's important uh, to know how to place a dialysis catheter. And so we're going to talk a tunnel dialysis catheter specifically. So we're just going to talk briefly about that. Um, so pretty reasonable goals, I think, for a 30 minute talk. Um, but why, why do you need to know this? Um, so all surgeons are involved in the care of patients with dialysis access. Um, and so preserving this access and planning forward is critical to the well being of your patients. And then I, I personally think all surgeons should be adept at placing tunnel dialysis lines and managing their complications. And you know whether you're deployed or uh, moonlighting or you're finally out of the army in your small hospital in North Dakota, you may be the only person that knows how to deal with the complication regarding access and there may not be vascular surgeons around. So I think having a, a base of understanding of this is important. And I, and I personally think dialysis access is the highest yield vascular uh, topic for boards. It's not sexy, but it is, very testable. So we're just going to talk quickly, start off with a, a bleeding fistula um, and make sure everyone's still awake. Uh, you know, I, I would ask people in there, it, you know, to raise a hand if they've uh, dealt with this before. Um, but this is a stressful si situation for the patients and providers. And it's not a particularly complex situation to deal with, but it is can definitely be stressful. And so knowing just sort of the very basics of, of taking care of this, I think is important. Um, so any patient that you're dealing with that uh, has a dialysis access complication, I, I think there's some critical questions that you need to answer. And before we fix this bleeding dialysis um, fistula, I think some of these things are critical to know. So is it autogenous or a graft? If you, if you forget to ask any question or figure out any answer, whether it's op reports, this is the single question, if you get answered, will help direct our management. How long has it been there? What is the anatomy? Is it brachial artery, radial artery, cephalic, basilic, all that? Um, have they been having difficulty with dialysis? Uh, this gives us a lot of information as to sort of the underlying cause. Uh, when was their last dialysis session? Were they able to complete it? Um, and then any recent interventions? So I think any patient with dialysis uh, access problems, I think getting these questions answered um, really helps guide management. So I, I found this picture online uh, and I, it's, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm sure, you know, Dr. Kazi is a lot more sophisticated than I am, but anytime I fix a fistula in the ER, this is what it looks like. Someone's holding two hands, there's blood everywhere, um, you know, holding proximal and distal control. And the other person is, you know, trying to see it well enough to put a stitch in it. And so just a, the, a few pointers here on uh, fixing this. So generally you can control with a finger initially, um, you know, before you're trying to repair it. Uh, get your iPro on, get your PPE on because it can be messy. Uh, have a colleague um, do proximal and distal control for you. And then you just put a figure of eight stitch, a U stitch or a purse string in it um, to kind of temporize things. So is there any uh, maybe R2s on the line? Uh, the, after you get the bleeding controlled, you have to address the underlying pathology. Can anyone tell me what the underlying pathology generally of a bleeding uh, fistula, say after a dialysis session is? Is it, a, is it a pseudoaneurysm? Uh, so generally it's a, a venous hypertension. So 
you know, you, you've created this arterial access. So you, you've hooked an artery into a vein and now your central venous system is seeing high flow venous pressures. The veins aren't used to that. So you look at this picture on the left here, you see this stenosis here. So now you have this arterial blood pouring in here, but it can't get out. So it finds the easiest path out, which a lot of times is that recent hole that was made by the dialysis access needle. Um, and so, you know, the venous system should be low pressure, but if it isn't, um, it's going to bleed out your fistula. So stopping the bleeding is good, but they're going to bleed again soon if you don't treat the underlying pathology. Um, and this is just a, a venogram uh, with ballooning. Uh, most of the time treats this and you can see how it's restored here. And so um, every patient that comes in with a bleeding fistula likely needs a fistula gram uh, to, to address this. Um, so, and there, there's one point that, you know, a nuance I didn't understand in, in training that I learned in fellowship, not all bleeding fistulas are the same. So the, the picture I had earlier, this is kind of the classic, they got accessed for dialysis. Um, the needle was pulled out and they bled through that hole that was created that, that time. Um, so that, that's one situation that's relatively easy to control. You can do the fistula gram sort of in a, you know, semi-urgent the next day sort of thing, two days if you need to, as long as it's not bleeding. But there are patients kind of to uh, whoever just answered that related that have pseudoaneurysms that have necrotic skin that have ulcers from uh, these large uh, fistulas. Um, and, and when these things bleed, in my personal opinion, it, it's, it's, it's pretty close to a surgical emergency. So this is not the patient you put a stitch in or you put five stitches in and put an ACE bandage on and see them the next morning. This actually happened in my fellowship. Uh, a resident, uh, you know, was trying to prevent calling the vascular fellow and they uh, stitched up one of these in the ER and it was a big ulcer. And, uh, and the long story short is the, they put an ACE, big ACE bandage on it that you couldn't really see around. And the, the patient exsanguinated on the floor um, because these are not really treatable. Um, these need a kind of a, a resection and reconstruction rather than just a, uh, a pinpoint suture. So kind of differentiating between these two is critical. Um, and, and the one on the right is a, is a surgical emergency if it is bleeding. So uh, this is kind of interesting. I think just something to keep in mind. Uh, in the UK, they actually give every dialysis patient this little bottle cap that they uh, hook to a keychain. And they're taught to, if it's bleeding, put this on and uh, wrap it with ACE bandage. And I've heard anecdotally a few stories of it being very successful. Um, so if you're you know, out at a football game or something and someone's bleeding, uh, this is probably a good way to do it and deal with it. So something to keep in mind. Um, and then just one other kind of, you know, these are all surgeons. Uh, and I, I believe if a patient comes to you for surgery and they have dialysis access, it is your responsibility to ensure that you know, nothing is done to harm this patient. And so there was a thyroidectomy being done in fellowship and they tucked the arms too tight and a patient of ours lost uh, her fistula that she'd had for five years and um, was subsequently catheter-based dialysis afterwards because she had no further, you know, adequate access. Later got a graft, but had no more autogenous access. So things like this, the nurses may or may not know the patients have uh, a fistula, um, and so really important to help prevent these kind of complications. Just keep that in mind if you're ever tucking the arms in these patients. So we do have to talk a little bit about sort of the, the thinking that goes into creating access. This is board relevant and also just helps you guys understand um, kind of what we go through as vascular surgeons. Um, we're going to keep this brief. Um, so just a background, there's a lot of people on dialysis in the U.S. It's increasing. Uh, over 600,000. Uh, the majority of these patients start with a catheter, uh, which is not ideal. Um, and then it's a very large part of the Medicare budget. And every, so if you just take outcomes aside, there's a big cost uh, in, uh, with catheters. So catheters cause infections, they cause hospitalizations. Um, and so th there's a lot of cost to, um, associated with these catheters. Um, and then a large proportion of the vascular surgery practice is generally referred after HD. I have to give Vamsi a little credit. I've had, I've done two fistulas here, both with Dr. Myers, and both of them were referred before they needed dialysis. So they're both, you know, set up and ready to go for whenever they do need dialysis. But in the kind of more general population, uh, that they, they're generally referred after already on dialysis with a catheter and they come in. 
Um, and then if they are preemptively referred, uh, their chances of starting with the catheter are significantly less. And so like, and we're gonna talk more about this, why catheters are a problem, but they cause infections, they cause central venous stenosis. Those are the two biggest things I think of um, as far as the problems with dialysis. As soon as you have that central venous stenosis thrombosis, you've hosed all of your upper extremity uh, you know, options. Um, and so getting those catheters out is critical. Um, so this slide is really just to kind of reemphasize this. So we're just going to fly through this, but basically it just, I, I had this in a different talk I gave to some vascular surgeons, but the mortality of a catheter versus fistula is significant. The mortality of a catheter versus a graft is also significant. Uh, catheters cause more deaths, have more infections, and then a graft versus fistula, it's not as dramatic as the mortality, but there is still um, negative outcomes associated with the grafts. Uh, so the SVS recommendations in regards to patients that need dialysis access, uh, early referral. Um, so, you know, this is more on the nephrology side, but, um, you know, or primary care side, but if you think they're getting close, uh, just get them in touch with a vascular surgeon so they can start planning or maybe a general surgeon where we can discuss if they want peritoneal dialysis. But um, you know, we want to get autogenous access in these patients, but the focus is on function rather than autogenous access, functional rather than autogenous. So uh, we're talking a little more about this, but there's this big push throughout the 2000s for fistula first. Um, and in some patients, that's not the right choice. Um, and so getting them a functional access is more important than having a non-functional autogenous access um, that they're still catheter based. So we really wanna take every patient into account and maybe every patient isn't right for a fistula. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the role of access surveillance and monitoring. Um, so you can see though, there has been success uh, from the 2000s of getting more AV fistulas in place and in use. And as we saw before, fistulas are better because they have less mortality, they have less infection. Um, and so the official first initiative really sort of helped help that significantly. You can see the um, the catheters and uh, grafts are going down and fistulas are all going up. And here's another reason fistulas are good. Not only do they have less infections, they're also uh, patent for longer. Um, and so so autogenous primary patency, um, which means you know you you hook it up and you don't do anything to it. Uh, twenty four percent or twenty four months, about fifty percent. Uh, and then if you, if you do some interventions, whether it's a fistula gram or whatever it may be, they're having close to 80% to your patency. You can see PTFE is generally about half. So uh, another good reason for fistulas is why we, and why we focus on them. All right, uh, interns are going to have to step up. I will search you out if you don't answer here. Uh, so you have a patient in the SICU recovering from sepsis from an NSTI. Unfortunately, now they're in renal failure and getting ready to go to a sniff. What are two considerations uh, before they discharge. They're currently dialyzing through a Merherker, which is just a central line uh, in the right IJ. Uh, so what two things uh, do you want to think about before discharging this patient? You can give me one thing. You don't have to name both at the same time. We'll start with one thing. Any, anything you wanna do, you wanna send them out with this uh, Merherker in the right IJ? All right, let's start searching here. I saw Todd on there, Todd. Yeah, I'm here. I was trying to figure the answer out. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm guessing the answer is no, you probably don't want to send them with that. Um, so what other options do you have then? <clears throat> um, so they're in, the, they're in the SICU, they're you know off pressers for a couple of days. They're still you know not super well, but there's a few things you can do to optimize their care on discharge. And you just said you don't want this line. So what other kind of line can you put in them? Any ideas? Yeah, I mean, would you try to get them like a tunneled catheter instead if you think exactly. it makes Exactly. So getting them a tunneled catheter sets them up for success. Uh, and, and I'm pretty sure a lot of SNFs wouldn't take them without a tunneled catheter. Uh, but um, something to think ahead. So yeah, getting them a tunneled catheter, we're going to talk about more in a minute, is critical um, to preventing infection. And, and, you know, then you're looking at weeks to months before they need a dialysis procedure. And then what, you know, they're probably going to want some sort of dialysis procedure for a permanent access, not a, a, a line of any sort. So what can you do to help facilitate the surgeon when they show up to the office um, in, a, in a couple of weeks to, to make that decision. Any ideas? 
Um, we try to get like a vein mapping. Exactly. So <laughs> if, if, if you help this patient get a tunnel line and get vein mapping, you're going to be a big help in getting these patients permanent access um, and, and keeping them safe in the meantime. So just things to be kind of thinking about in your patients that are on uh, dialysis in the ICU. So some sort of our operative decision making, uh, we're just going through the basics on this. Um, Preoperative ultrasound. So this is kind of obvious now. Apparently it wasn't in the past. Parent people would just look at people's arm veins and decide if they look good. Clearly it's helpful to determine. Um, the, um, so if they have inadequate vein mapping, um, in the pre-op, you should not say, you should book them still for official possible graft. Um, I guess it depends on how terrible their veins look, but, uh, because a lot of times after they get the block, um, many times they'll have some, uh, venous dilation. I've actually, of, of my two fistulas that I've had here, one first fish, uh, ultrasound showed that they did not have adequate access. Um, but on a repeat, uh, ultrasound, they demonstrated that they actually had great veins and kind of unclear why that is. Um, they were more hydrated one day, they got the block, whatever it is. Um, sometimes you can still get these patients autogenous access uh, the day of surgery. So they should have this pre up vein mapping, but it shouldn't be the end all be all. Uh, the one thing uh, when you're talking to these patients in pre op, it's important to our pre op ultrasounds won't tell us if they have central venous stenosis. So looking to see if they ever had arm swellings, collaterals dilated veins, history of multiple catheters in their neck uh, might, you know, make us think about going to the other side. So I, I'm just going to answer these questions, but uh, what size artery do you want? These, so these, these next few slides are sort of like abscite. These are just like the things that are going to show up on abscite and we just have to hit them. Uh, so two millimeters, greater than equal or two millimeters, you've got a good artery. You don't want it super calcified. Some of these dialysis patients that have been on dialysis for a long time, diabetics, they're going to have pretty calcified, but uh, in general, you want greater than two millimeters. And then what size vein do you want? Uh, you want greater than equal to three millimeters. So um, that, that will give you your best uh, outcomes. And that, that'll be your board answers. Uh, two millimeters for the artery, three millimeters for the vein. Um, so like we talked about, there, there's a few situations um, that, you know, you, you go straight to a graft. Um, and, and, and this is important for the outcomes of the patient. And so um, any patient, so sometimes you see a patient with kind of marginal veins and, uh, but they're already on dialysis, probably not the patient you want to spend six months getting a fistula up and running, whether it's a radiocephalic, um, you know, if they have beautiful veins and, and it's going to be a nice, uh, nice brachio um, cephalic fistula that's going to, you know, likely mature quickly, you know, you can go ahead, but if they're already on dialysis, you want to have a shorter uh, leash to giving them a graft because getting them off that catheter is the most important thing um, rather than a graft versus an autogenous. So if they have a short life expectancy, you have a patient um, super elderly, has a lot of comorbidities, you don't have three to six months to get their fistula up and running. You know, their, their life expectancy is a year. Um, maybe, maybe a graft is the best answer for them. Uh, morbid obesity, they've shown to have uh, worse outcomes with fistulas. So think about the graft for these patients. And then of course, unfavor of favorable vascular anatomy. So this has definitely been a question on the ab site before, sort of they give you a bunch of choices of access configuration um, to prevent the pain of asking people questions. We're just going to go through it. So you obviously start proximal, or I'm sorry, distal in the arm with vein options. So radiocephalic right by the wrist there. If they had a snuff box fistula, sure, that would be the right answer. But I think radiocephalic is the, you know, probably the best answer right by the wrist. Um, also has the lowest, you know, maturation rates. Um, so then uh, a brachiocephalic, a brachiocephalic is kind of the, the next line. So that's just above or right around the elbow. Um, and this is kind of the kind of go-to workhorse uh, fistula that we create. Um, the cephalic vein runs on the top of the arm. So it, it's in a nice position for dialysis already. So you just plug it into the brachial artery and give it time, hopefully, and, you know, um, hopefully you'll have a great access. Then you have your brachial basilic. Basilic vein runs on the underside of the arm. So unfortunately, it is not just a one-step procedure or it's a more involved one-step procedure where you have to actually superficialize it and make it sort of in the position of the cephalic vein in order to be accessed. But um, 
you know, it's definitely, it would definitely, if you had a choice, you'd definitely do the brachiocephalic first because it's a simple one stage procedure. The brachiobasilic, there's two Bs. So um, there's two steps to it. Um, so yeah, you don't want to choose that uh, before you do your brachiocephalic. Uh, and then of course, then you go to your prosthetic options. You got your forearm prosthetic um, and then your upper arm prosthetic grafts, uh, you know, so even with, even when you're considering grafts, if you can give them a um, graft in the distal arm, uh, that's better uh, first. And you know, we've actually, we have a patient here that we, you know, started with a graft in the distal arm. It eventually failed, but the venous high flow that we created through that forearm prosthetic graft has actually made him a uh, candidate for an autogenous uh, graft above the elbow where his veins were too small before, but you know, now they've been have seen high flow uh, for a while. And, and now this patient is actually going to, is getting set up for an autogenous, uh, fistula. So, and then, so once you do your forearm prosthetic, if that fails, then you go to your upper arm prosthetic, and then we're going to kind of leave it at that. We're not going to talk about groins and chest options. I think this is kind of, uh, for this topic, this is all we need to cover. Um, so, uh, Todd, since you're the only person I see on here right now, cause it's just showing me one person, what would you guess? And this is a total guess. Uh, what do you think the maturation rate for official is? You hook a brachiocephalic up and, you know, what percentage of patients in a few months are going to be able to dialyze with nothing else done? Um, we'll go with 50 to 60%. Yeah, great. Good job. I don't know if you saw it or what, but great answer. Uh, so, yeah. So, I, you know, I don't think I appreciated this uh, for a long time. The majority of these fistulas uh, don't mature, um, or, you know, about 50%. Um, so many of them need secondary interventions to uh, become matured. So fistula maturation, what does this even mean? Uh, so, you know, you're trying to get this outflow vein dilated that they can stick a needle in it, uh, two needles in it and, and take high flow uh, blood and put it in the dialysis circuit and put it back in. So you need it to arterialize, you need it to thicken. And the average time for this, and, and this is what we're talking about, the planning, how, what's their life expectancy, how long they've been on dialysis already. It takes at least three months uh, to get these fistulas on the median time uh, to get these fistulas up and running. Um, so it's not a quick thing. Uh, rules of sixes, I'm not going to torture you guys, but this is definitely board relevant, everything relevant. You need 600 milliliters per minute of flow through the fistula. Um, you don't want it deeper than six millimeters under the skin and, and the diameter of the fistula should be six millimeters. Uh, you know, these aren't hard and fast rules necessarily, but for boards and things like that, it's, it's, it's a good rule of thumb to decide if a fistula is ready to be accessed. Um, we're going to blow through this, uh, facility, you can, there's ways to facilitate maturation, following them with ultrasound is good. You can do balloon angioplasty where you actually, can, if they're not getting big enough, you actually can go in there and, and put big balloons in and help these veins sort of dilate up. Um, uh, if there's accessory branches, taking the flow out of the, the fistula, you can, uh, ligate them, um, to help it stay within the fistula and then treating a central venous stenosis. Um, some fistula complications we're going to just quickly talk about, um, Infection. So this is the second leading cause of death for patients on dialysis. Uh, first being cardiac uh, morbidity, but the, the second is infection. And so leaving that catheter in um, or have, is, is a very high uh, cause of death in these patients. So if it's a graft, it will need to be explanted. It's, it's definitely on your boards, that's for sure the answer. There's a few times we're able to salvage these. Uh, without explanting, but if it's a graft, you'll need to explant, and then you don't want to put the TDC at the same time. You want to clear this blood infection and then get them a TDC. Um, you could even use a temporary dialysis line in the meantime before you place the TDC. You want to make sure their blood cultures are, are negative uh, long before you place a, your, your TDC. Uh, fistulas, infections are rare, but sometimes you see cellulitis around a hematoma uh, or, or different things, and antibiotics will likely treat this. So like I said, when you're having an infection in the ER, knowing whether it's a graft or fistula totally changes the management. Um, and so making that differentiation is critical. Bleeding, we've already discussed, likely an outflow stenosis, need to treat it. Thrombosis, uh, persons in the ER, they have a thrombos graft. Okay, if they have a thrombos graft, you're thinking, all right, we can, we can probably salvage this. You can do a thrombectomy. If it's a fistula, fistulas do not do well with thrombectomy. Uh, you're basically, uh, the intima of, of a fistula does not respond uh, well and will likely re-thrombose. There are some fistulas we're able to salvage. Um, so it's definitely not a no chance, 
but in general, a fistula is likely going to be, they're likely going to need new access, whereas a, a graft are likely to, you know, be able to uh, get that declotted. Uh, hematomas. Uh, so sometimes if you access these grafts uh, or fistulas too early and they haven't had time to sort of incorporate, uh, they can get hematomas around them uh, or sometimes they're accessed poorly. They, they double stick it through and through and it bleeds in the back. Uh, these are these can be big problems, and sometimes they're going to need to go on a catheter for a while to let their arm heal up. Steel, whole different talk, uh, but you know, ligate it is the kind of easiest answer, uh, not the best answer always. Drill procedures, proximalization, inflow. There's other ways to treat the steel syndromes, uh, aneurysmal, uh, and um, so kind of outside the scope of this, but you can perform, you can fix these and maintain their access. So. I just want to end this talk talking about catheters. I, I, you know, I've spent this whole talk telling you how bad catheters are, uh, but unfortunately it's the necessary evil. These patients do need catheters. And I know early on in residency, I was for whatever reason, a little confused by tunneled and non-tunneled and how you place them. And there's sort of a mystery to me. We always just sent them to IR and then they went to nephrology and I never really saw them again. Uh, and so it's very simple. If you guys place ports, you're already a, uh, you know, rock star in this. It's the same thing essentially. Uh, but a non-tonal catheter, sometimes they're called Maherkers, it's literally just a central line. It's a, a central line with two large bore ports that allow one for inflow, one for outflow for the dialysis circuit. Uh, they're, they're, they're pretty big, so it's not, you know, the eight French, uh, you know, central line kit, but it is the same procedure as putting a central line. Um, and, but, you know, these are things you only want to have in for days to weeks due to the high infection risk. A tunnel dialysis catheter, TDC, they're called. Um, Hickman or Permacath or other names people use for them. These can be used for weeks to months. Sometimes, unfortunately, patients with no other options, they, they, you know, this is all they get. Um, and we, you know, do everything to avoid that. But these are tunneled lines. And the advantage of a tunneled line is it prevents infection. You have a the, kind of the skin barrier um, protecting the line from getting infected. And so these are definitely high risk for infection, but not as high risk as just your standard uh, non-tunneled line or Maherker. Um, so what vessel should be used for a tunneled line? You want to use your right IJ, uh, less kinking than the left IJ. They've actually shown right IJ versus left IJ, there's a longer patency. You know, it has to cross the brachiocephalic vein and enter the heart uh, coming from the left, whereas the right just goes straight down the IJ into the atrium. Um, so right IJ, if at all possible, is what you want to use for a tunneled line. What about subclavian? I know there's a few of you, you know, these are big trauma people here. I can stick the subclavian, no problem. I don't even need the ultrasound in the OR. I'm just gonna do it subclavian. Um, but no, uh, that puts our future access at risk. It caused central venous stenosis. That's our outflow for our arm uh, grafts and fistulas. So please, please, please avoid the subclavian uh, at all costs. So uh, this is super basic. And uh, just for maybe the interns and R2s in the lines that haven't placed ports or tunnel lines, I just wanna demystify it. Um, so you want to access the IJ low in the neck, and we'll, sh we'll show that why later. Um, it's just, just like anything else, micropuncture, put the wire in, confirm with fluoroscopy that you're in the vein and that it's going down to the right atrium. You really want to dilate this hole up big because you're going to be taking dilators through there and you're going to be taking your tunneler through there. So really dilate this up. It's going to make the rest of the procedure easier for you. Uh, and then you measure, you take your... Uh, your uh, tunnel dialysis line and kind of place it on the chest. I actually take an x-ray and um, see if it looks like it's in good position in the right atrium uh, and then see where it comes out on the skin. So this is kind of a critical part of the case. Um, you don't wanna um, kind of be too long and then it's hanging up in the you know, brachiocephalic vein. Um, one thing I do differently, I do not put the dilator in yet. Uh, I leave just that the, either just the wire in or the microcatheter because like I said, we, we dilated that hole up to bring the tunneler through. And when you have this um, big sheaf in there, it's hard to bring the, it makes it more difficult to get the tunneler out there. So it's just a small little step. It doesn't make a difference in the long run. It just makes it a little easier in my opinion to leave um, the wire. And so then you take your tunneler through. Um, and so you tunnel from your little skin nick on the chest and bring it out and your catheter is attached to the tunneler right here. Um, and then uh, you place inside your peel away sheath, just like you do a central line. And so as much as it's important, the distal tip, I think when you're looking at these x-rays, the most important part is actually up here. 
You want to see if there's any kinks, any twists, and you can see why you want to access low in the IJ. If you access high in the IJ, it's going to have a kink. It's going to have to go up and then down. So you really try and get kind of as low in the neck as you can when you make this access. But, you know, uh, that's really all it is. And now you're suturing in your, uh, your nylons here, closing your little skin neck here, and that's a TDC. So I think everyone on this call is uh, very capable of doing a TDC and, and, and should be able to offer their patients that if they need it. Um, so looks like we kept it just about to 30 minutes. Um, so in conclusion, most surgeons are involved in the care of patients with dialysis access, and it's important to recognize the needs of these patients and to help ensure access options for the future. Fistula is better than a graft, and both of those are much, much better than a catheter. So let's do what we can to keep these catheters out of these patients. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, careful consideration going into deciding on what patients get and the order in which they get it um, to pr prolong their access. And then, um, and like I talked about, there's been a little bit of a shift in the past five years of, a, of away from fistula first to functional access first. Um, so I hope we uh, met those goals and uh, kept it within our kind of time limit here. So um, feel free to ask any questions. Thanks, Dr. Dr. Canary. That was great. Um, I've I've heard about like these single stage brachial basilic fistulas. Uh, if the vein is of a certain size, have you ever done that? Yeah. Um, and so, if you have a beautiful basilic vein, uh, you know it's like three point five millimeters throughout, and it looks and they're you know a good surgical candidate. Um, then you can, you know, make the long incision on the arm, harvest the entire basilic vein tunnel it in the position that you want it in and plug it into the brachial artery. The reason you don't want to do this in other patients is it's a marginal basilic vein. Maybe it's three and it has a little stenosis somewhere in it, or it's you know, scarred. Um, you don't want to give them this big incision and have it not mature later. So, uh, you know, I think I'm going to lean towards doing it uh, two stages where I just make that little anastomosis between the basilic and the brachial artery, see how it matures. And then uh, if, it, if it looks good later, um, you know, do the second stage procedure. But a one stage procedure is definitely a good option in, in the select, you know, low risk patient that has a good vein. Thank you. All right, enjoy. Uh, hope everyone gets to eat some turkey, even if it's just with your close friends or uh, close family. So have a good day. <laughs>